And thank you all for coming out here on this dark and rainy night. The one great thing about that extra hour of sleep is that um, we actually lose an hour of daylight in the afternoon, right? But it's a little bit lighter when we get up. So thank you for coming out here on this deep, dark, wet Sunday night. And I hope that you'll be glad uh, that you came out uh, for this. First thing I want to say is that we had a great uh, deacon ordination examination time uh, with, our, um, with our deacons and our three deacon candidates. We're going to have a, a service, an ordination service, on a Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, and you're going to want to come uh, to that. Uh, Mr. Kerry Trapnell, Mr. Matt Babb, and Mr. Mike Royal are going to be um, recommended uh, for ordination. And uh, so uh, you uh, want to come to that and not miss it. It's going to be very, very meaningful. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Numbers. As I was preparing this, as you know, I'm going to try to get through the, the book of Numbers uh, in an hour. And as I, was, um, as I was doing this, I realized that about halfway through uh, my study, I got so in- interested in the book of Numbers that I totally left the workbook book content. So um, Susan does want you to know that the answers to those blanks are in the back of your book. If I don't cover them, I think that most of those blanks I'll cover them, but literally towards the end, I... Um, I uh, just kind of left the workbook as, as I started looking at all the wonderful things in the book of Numbers, all the great stories, all the wonderful truths, um, and, uh, and uh, just, the, just the overall direction uh, of the book of Numbers. And uh, then just today I realized I'm not so sure that I've really covered all of, the, all of the blanks, but I think I did. So I'll know after I finish this. You know... In the book of Numbers, really, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, deserts are prominent. Many believers went through the desert in the Bible. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. The children of Israel endured the desert, uh, sent there by God, first of all, to deliver them and to meet them, and then secondly, sent there by God because of disobedience. Believers today experience deserts. We use that desert as a metaphor of sorrow. The desert of sorrow. The desert of confusion. The desert of hurt. The desert of despair. And that metaphor really is true. And I think that in Numbers we can, uh, we can see that sometimes these desert experiences are a result of just living in a sinful fallen world. We just live in a sinful fallen world where our bodies wear out and where evil people do evil things. At other times, we find ourselves in the middle of a desert or in the middle of the wilderness due to our own sinful actions, our own attitudes, our own choices. Desert experiences are inevitable. But in all these desert experiences, these trials and tribulations, we want to make sure that unbelief is never a part of the equation. And the book of Numbers is called a lot of different things. But if there's one overarching term that you, that you glean as you read the book of Numbers, it's that it, this is the book of unbelief. Unbelief is not doubt. Doubt is a sense of worry that we might not have enough belief. But unbelief is a total rejection of the Lord. Christians have sorrow but should not have unbelief. Christians experience despair, but should not have unbelief. Temptation is real, but it is not unbelief. Some Christians even rebel, but should never experience unbelief. And doubt, doubt is not unbelief. And you know, people that doubt their salvation sometimes, man, I must have lost my salvation because I'm having doubts about my salvation. Or maybe I've never gotten saved because I have doubts about my salvation. Well, doubt is a is a sense of worry that you don't have enough faith. Unbelief is outright rejection of Christ. Doubt sometimes, doubt sometimes is, a, is a confirmation that you have faith in the Lord because you're worried, you're anxious about whether you have enough true enduring belief and faith in the Lord. Tonight we're going to be looking again at the book of Numbers, this overarching term that we could apply to this book of the Bible, the book of unbelief. Now, I want you to remember this phrase, as we kind of journey through all these chapters in the book of Numbers. First of all, remember this phrase, trust in God brings rest. We see that over and over again in the book of Numbers. Conversely, unbelief brings a storm. Trust in God brings rest. Unbelief brings just a storm. Unbelief brings 
despair. Unbelief brings trouble. The Israelites started well. They were trusting in God. They, uh, they followed God's instructions for the Passover. Um, they were cocooned in His rest there at the foot of Mount Sinai. But then doubt and pride and fear crept into their ranks and their belief waned and they lost their rest. This amazing collection study, we've seen this over and over again and you will see this over and over again in the Bible as the children of Israel leave God, their unbelief brings them trouble, they return to God and their trust in God brings them rest. We've been looking in this study at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Numbers is the fourth book. Can you believe it? We've gotten through four books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and now Numbers. Moses is, was the main character of faith in Exodus and Leviticus, but not in this one. The real actual characters of faith in the book of Numbers are Joshua and Caleb. The unbelief of Moses and the unbelief of the people of Israel brought them unrest in the book of Numbers. Now, Numbers is always getting a bad rap. We kind of lump it in with Leviticus as being a book that we don't read much and it's not very interesting. But you'll notice Numbers was a lot more interesting than the book of Leviticus. It is full of some interesting stories and interesting insights and uh, really relevant things that bring truth for every generation, including you and me. Numbers is a book about real people. When they relied upon God, they had rest in Him. Conversely, when they had unbelief, they got into trouble. This book we call Numbers. Numbers. It's had a lot of different titles down through uh, the ages. In the Jewish scriptures, it's sometimes called the Book of Murmurings. And you can understand that if you read through it, because they were constantly murmuring uh, and, and complaining. I preached about that this morning. They complained about the food. They complained about the taste of the bread. They complained about not having meat. They complained about the water. They complained about the leadership. The book of Numbers has also been known as the book of wanderings or the wilderness wanderings. And this is accurate because that short trip from the foot of Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, which leads into the promised land, uh, actually should have taken about 11 days. Uh, it took 40 years. Another Hebrew name for the book of Numbers is In the Desert. In the desert. And that is a great title for the book of Numbers as well. It speaks of their plight, not only physically, but spiritually. In the book of Numbers, we see that the people are in the desert. They're in the desert physically and spiritually. The unbelief of the Israelite is what brought them into the desert to just wander uh, for, for, uh, for decade after, after decade. Now, there are references in the book being called by the title, And the Lord Said. There's some ancient references. Book of Numbers was called, And the Lord Said. And this is good because the phrase, And the Lord Said, occurs about 150 times in the book of Numbers. God is speaking to His people, and uh, this emphasizes, really in the, even in the Old Testament, the personal relationship with the Lord that we can have and that the people of Israel had. And the Lord said, that's a personal relationship being described there. It was only uh, really in the time of the Greek Septuagint, when the Greek translation of the Bible, that the book of Numbers was used. So the title of the book is Numbers. This title probably comes from the census that God commanded them to take, along with all of the lists and all of the numbers in the book. God tells them to take a census to prepare them to mobilize an army for war. And actually in the book of Numbers, there ended up being two censuses taken, if you remember, after their wanderings. This new generation is finally ready to go into the promised land. They take yet another census. So the book of Numbers is also a great title. Turn to page 105 in your workbook. We're going to get to the outline. I hope I do good on this. Chapters 1 through 10. God prepared the Israelites to enter the promised land. God prepared the Israelites to enter the promised land. In chapters 1 and 10, what he had in mind was something dramatic and powerful and effective. But that's not what happened. In the next 11 chapters, God prevented the Israelites from entering the promised land. Because 
of their unbelief. And we're going to get into that later on. And then the book ends on a positive note. In the last 15 chapters, God prepared the new generation of Israelites to enter the promised land. And by this time, the old generation had died off. And they were back resting in the Lord. They were back believing in God. And their belief brought rest. The first division in your outline, let's go to chapter 1 of the book of Numbers. That finds the Israelites still camped at Mount Sinai. Still camped there like they were at the end of Exodus. And during the whole book of Leviticus, it's been 13 months since their celebration of freedom and deliverance from Egypt. And uh, so they've been there 13 months. The foot of Mount Sinai, God has gotten to know him. He's walked with him. He's given him his laws. He's given him his, his commandments. He's forged a great nation out of this, out of this group of uh, newly freed slaves. And after 13 months, the Lord now basically says, Moses, I want you to take a census. I want you to number all of the men of the children of Israel ages 20 and up. God is building an army of fighting men. God is preparing His people to enter the promised land by, number one, taking a census, by, number two, cleaning them up, and then, number three, by being in communion with them. And this must have been an exciting time. I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of camping. I might like it for the first hour when I go out there and the, you know, the mountains are so beautiful. And then I look around and, you know, I hear a cricket and something moves in the grass. And I'm ready to go back to the Ramada Inn. All right, so, so they'd been out here 13 months. And oh, how excited they were. How, how excited they must have been to get into this promised land, the land that they had heard of, the land of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, these folks had been slaves. They'd never governed themselves. They'd never been out of the land of Goshen in Egypt except for 13 months in the desert, camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they were large in number. Commentators are all over the board on this. Some say as high as 2.5 million people, whatever the actual number this nation was moving into their land. And it was a large undertaking. Now, if you look at the numbers in the book of Numbers, you see that there were numbers of 600,000 men able to go to war. And that's not counting the Levites. Remember, they were set aside to take care of the tabernacle and to do religious and ceremonial duties. And uh, God wanted them numbered. So Moses was definitely the man to lead this effort. He was educated in Egypt in Pharaoh's own court. He probably learned the most accurate methods of counting and record keeping. Remember Joseph? Remember that famine? Remember all the record keeping they had to take during the famine? You know, doling out the grain, saving it for seven years, you know, gifts, um, you know, selling it for seven more years during the, during the lean years. And so Joseph and the tremendous storage and distribution and logistics of that. Moses grew up in that milieu. He also needed to get them organized to travel in an efficient fashion. I think this has something to do with the outline, but you'll just have to look and see. He identified each of the tribe with a banner. And the reason that he needed to do this is because they were like a large city moving around in the desert. So he organized them by tribes and each tribe had a banner and he assigned them a specific space around the tabernacle. You know, some, the south side, the north side, and they were supposed to camp there. There were banners for Dan and Asher and Gad and Manassas and, and the other eight tribes as well. They, they read like road signs uh, as they surrounded the Ark of the Covenant. God organized them when they were resting, where they were to camp. God organized them when they were marching, how they were to march, what order they should march in. And the Lord told Moses all the details in the first ten chapters. And the people did all that the Lord commanded. You'll see that phrase over and over again in the book of Numbers. They surrounded the ark while it was resting with the ark of the covenant there in the center, the tabernacle in the center of all the tribes. When they marched, the ark went out ahead of them and the people did as the Lord commanded. And God didn't stop with the census He didn't stop with giving them laws on how to serve and obey Him. He didn't stop with all the regulations on how to worship Him. He also gave them a way to communicate using trumpets. And the Bible says, oh, great, great commandments on how to do the trumpets and what to blast on the trumpet means. But bottom line, the people did all that the Lord commanded. And the Lord said to keep everybody together. 
And he says, I want them to look different. I want them to get cleaned up. I want them to get consecrated, to get ready for this journey. Clean out the tabernacle. Sanctify the warriors. What an exciting time. They're entering in to the promised land. And the Bible says the people did as the Lord commandment. All illness was removed from the camp. And the people did as the Lord commanded. Then God said to His people, I want you all to celebrate the Passover. He wanted them to remember the spiritual feeding as well as the spiritual feeding. Now, this is probably the first time they celebrated the Passover since they celebrated the Passover there in Egypt and the death angel had gone uh, 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 over their homes and protected them and yet took the firstborn of the um, of the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Egyptians, and the people did as the Lord commanded. God wanted, God wanted them to remember, not only are they getting fed by Him, their physical feeding, but He wanted them to remember the spiritual feeding that He was giving them. He wanted them to remember His power, to remember that death angel had no, had no, um, had no power over them, and yet it wiped out their enemies. He wanted them to have that faith and remember as they prepared to go to war. And the Bible says the people did as the Lord commanded. Everything's going great at this point. How can they mess this up? God's feeding them. He's leading them. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And um, he's given them detailed instructions on where to camp and what to do. Nothing can go wrong here. Perfect communion with God. It was a time of great rest. They trusted in Him. A time of great expectation. That's all they had to do. Just, just trust in the Lord. They didn't have to know where they were going. They didn't have to know the meaning of some of the detailed instructions that they were being given. All they had to do, all they had to do was trust. All they had to do was trust. You know, I get to visit people. You know, at different times, and elder care is such a great thing. Just pe- there are people that just love, you know, elder care and senior adults. You know, Anna Mills, what a wonderful woman she is, has loved senior adults. I love senior adults, and in visiting senior adults, you know, there's when you when you see senior adults that are, for example, in in rest homes, in assisted living communities. There, there are the there are, there are some folks that that don't know what's going on. They've got some dementia sitting in. And you know, it's really, it's really sad when some people have dementia and, and they're worried. They don't know where they are. They don't know who I am. They don't know what their surroundings are and it troubles them. And then you have other people that have dementia and man, they're going on a trip every day somewhere. You know, they're, they're on vacation. Man, their husband's still alive. And they have a great relationship and, you know, they just, they just, but these are folks that have, they don't have a clue, but they have just, they just have trust. Where, where I'm at is fine. And, and even though they're totally dependent upon someone else to lead them, to clothe them, um, to clean them, they're, they're happy and they have, they have trust. And so one of the things I pray for our folks that are shut in at home and in assisted care communities and in nursing homes, that God would give them rest. That just God would give them, just God would give them comfort and make them those that that have have comfort. One of my favorite stories about a a, a lady that uh, was starting to have some dementia sitting in was um, John and Donna Avant. Do you remember that story of John and Donna Avant, a pastor friend of mine, pastor at First West, and um, his first, his first um, pastorate was a seminary church. And this is a church, you know, these small churches that, that you just pastor when you're in seminary. And so he had been there like um, three years and he was ready from, to graduate from seminary. And so some pulpit committees started contacting him. They wanted him to come to be pastor of their church. And the problem is... He had this church. It, when he started, it had, about, it had about 50 people in a small room, and now they were up to 100. And he said, this, a, a pulpit committee that comes to this church, they're, they're just going to be noticed. So he said, yeah, I think I, I want you to come. But he says, can you just, can you just, be, as, um, can you just be as discreet as possible? Come in the back door and 
try to just sit, you know, maybe apart. You know how pulpit. How many of you have ever served on a pulpit committee? You know, you know, try to sit in different places in the church. Just be as discreet as possible because this is a small venue. It's going to happen. And so uh, anyway, the pulpit committee got lost. They couldn't find the church. So they came in late. They came in late. The church was packed. There were no seats except some right in the front. They all came to the front, sat together in. So there's this lady on the second row. She has dementia. So John Avant, he's already nervous. He's already sweating. He's up there making the announcement. And he just notices this woman. She looks at him. She looks at the pulpit committee. She looks at him. She looks at the pulpit committee. And probably in her only moment of clarity, probably in five years, she stands up. She takes a hymn book. She hits one of the men over the head. She turns to the church and says, pulpit committee. So, so, so uh, anyway, that that's, could be one of the worst experiences that I can imagine. In many ways, the children of Israel really did not have a clue about where they were going and how they were going to be taken care of and who was going to feed them and, and these detailed instructions. But, but they were at this point... They did all that the Lord commanded. They were totally dependent upon Him. And sometimes we just don't know what's going on. But all we have is trust. And that's what God asks. Just trust in me. So I can imagine what it was like uh, to be there with God. They depended on Him from manna. You know, they, the Lord sent the manna. They depended on Him from water. I don't mention this much, but if you remember, their clothes didn't wear out. Do you remember that? Their clothes didn't wear out, and that's very important. Thirteen months in the desert, there's no place to set up looms and to, and to, and to, and to, and to make, make cloth out of wool or cotton. And so their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, God was taking care of them. The pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day. That's where He wanted them to be, trusting in Him. And it was a time of rest for them because... Um, because uh, they trusted in Him. But now it's time to get on the road to the promised land. Take the census and, and get ready. Here's how you're going to march. Here's how you're going to camp. Nothing, nothing could be better. Nothing can go wrong at this point. But then the second division of the book of Numbers. Part of me wishes they could have just stayed camped at Mount Sinai in the presence and care of the Lord. But at the beginning of the second division... Things uh, have not turned out so well. Chapter 11 and going on through. Uh, sadly, uh, this division is the heart of the book of Numbers. And uh, they begin to lose their trust. And they begin to start to complain. In chapters 13 and 14, over only 20 days after taking the census, we see them moving out towards the promised land. Now if you notice here in... in uh, in biblical geography, they only have an 11-day trip to Kadesh Barnea, the southernmost part of the land of Canaan as they go in, their staging point to take possession of the land, the promised land. But only three days into their 11-day trip, the complaining starts. And that's one reason that the Lord didn't end up letting them into the promised land. Because of their complaining and because of their grumbling. God had provided everything. But like kids complaining on a long trip, they start. This is too hard. The food is bad. Like kids on a trip, he looked at me. She touched me. <laughs> Parents, I'm going to pull this car over and give you a swat. And that's what basically God does. He says, I'm pulling this car over and giving you a swat. And he gives them a swat in the form of a plague. He gives them a swat in the form of a plague. And a couple of days later, the rabble starts complaining. The rabble starts coming, that small group. There's not enough to eat. We miss the food in Egypt. But they were slaves in Egypt and they ate scraps. As I said this morning, selective memory. So God pulls over, gives them another slap, another plague. And um, then they begin to grumble about the leadership. Y'all don't ever do that. All right. They begin to grumble about the leadership. This is an offense to God. Since the leadership, Moses, 
had been chosen by God. Remember the burning bush? So they began to complain about their, the leadership. And even Miriam, Moses' sister, gets involved. And Aaron, Moses' brother, gets involved. They get in on the action. They start complaining about Moses. God pulls over, gives them another swat. Miriam gets leprosy and has to go outside the camp for seven days. Moses intercedes for her. God forgives her. He heals her. She has, she's unclean seven days outside the camp. Now, notice that every time the people grumbled, God disciplines them. That's, that's the great thing about my parents. They were very consistent in discipline. We weren't, me and Susan, we were not consistent in discipline like my parents were. My, my dad was an army sergeant. My mom was an elementary school teacher. I couldn't get away with anything growing up. They were very consistent in their discipline. And when they pull over and gave me a swat, they made it just severe enough where I said, wow, I'm never doing that again. Now, my sisters, were they, they kicked against the goads a lot. I got very few spankings. As I said to the 830 crowd, I was not a slow learner like my, my sisters. Man, they were tough. So anyway, they, God gives them another swat. God disciplines them. And God made it harsh. Again, they, at this point, they weren't super rebellious. They weren't killing each other and they weren't engaged in idolatry. As I said this morning, but... But again, you need to know this about complaining. Any form of grumbling and complaining about God is an attack on His character. He had given the Israelites all these good gifts of food and clothing and protection. So He had to do something about their whining. And for the sake of His glory, He disciplines us. And I think He disciplined them to give us an example here in the 21st century. As I said this morning, grumbling and whining and complaining is verbal rebellion, which leads eventually to rebellion and actions, and indeed, that's what happened. The next thing we see after they complained was disobedience in the children of Israel. All right, they finally make the 11-day trip, and they find themselves at the edge of the promised land. Okay. They had some bumps along their journey. God had to pull over and give them a few swats, but now nothing can go wrong. They're at the edge of the promised land. They're on the cusp of victory. And so Moses, under the direction of God, sends a reconnaissance mission consisting of a leader from each of the 12 tribes. Now, if you remember, the 12 tribes loosely correspond to the 12 sons of Jacob with just a couple of little changes there. Well, the 12 guys come back 40 days later. That's an important number to, to remember. They're gone for 40 days. They come back 40 days later, and they have so much fruit that it takes two people to carry just one bunch of grapes. That's how just luscious these, and huge these bunches of grapes were. And so this is a land that flows with milk and honey. And the 12 spies, they say that. This is a land that flows with milk and honey. But there's only one problem. Ten of the spies say, Man, it's a land that's full with milk and honey, but we have no hope of conquering this land. They're giants in that land. We look like grasshoppers in our sight. They're way too big for us. We can't do it. Ten of the spies say that. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, pleaded with the people and with the other spies. In Numbers 14, 9, he says, Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. King James Version says, They are bread for us. Isn't that great? Don't worry about, don't worry about these folks. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't be afraid of these people. They're bread for us. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. And the people almost stone them for saying that. In other words, these two spies say, look, we can take them. We have the Lord on our side. It's almost like the speech that David gave to the, to the, to the other Israelites when they were about to fight Goliath. He's going, why are you scared of this guy? Who's on the Lord's side? We have the Lord on our side. That's what these spies are saying. We, we can take them. The other spies had made fear into a giant, and their fear made them into grasshoppers. And in losing their faith, they had also made God into a grasshopper. We, God can't help us. We're just too small, and they're just 
too big. But Joshua and Caleb says, don't rebel against the Lord by losing your faith. So uh, their lack of faith in God was considered rebellion by the Lord. And now disbelief brings unrest. So the rebellion occurred and they tell God, no, we're not going in. Telling God no is always ironic to me. Remember when um, in the book of Acts when um, Peter had the dream and the sheet came down from heaven with all the unclean animals on it and God said, kill and eat. Remember that? And the most ironic phrase, Peter says, no, Lord. Now that's an oxymoron, isn't it? No, Lord. How can you say no and then say Lord? If he's your Lord, you're not going to say no. No, Lord. That's like, um, that's like in Walhalla, South Carolina, we had a little convenience store called the Superette. That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? The superette. No, Lord. Jumbo shrimp. You know, the oxymorons in life. My dad, who was in the Army his whole career, said, military intelligence. That's his, that was his. And uh, I don't agree with that. The military is the most respected, but my dad. You know, military are great complainers. Have I mentioned that to you before? They, 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 they make it into an art form. No, Lord. We're not going in. But no in any form when you tell that to the Lord is rebellion. You know, when a two-year-old says no, it's cute, but it really isn't, is it? It really isn't. It? You got to, you got to, it's not, it's not cute, Asher. Got to pop their little hand. Make them cry. No, Lord. No, Lord. You know, it's cute, but if they're running into the road, it's not cute if they say no and turn and run. Now, God said, I could smite you with a pestilence and disinherit you. You remember? But Moses says, Lord, then the surrounding nations will say, the Lord was not able to deliver his people. Remember that? Remember, Moses says, he, he, he advocates on the part of the people. He says, no, these folks in the surrounding nations will hear and say, Lord, this God of Israel wasn't able to deliver his, his people. So then God related then that he's just going to let this generation die off. And for those of you who didn't believe, God says, I'm going to just prevent you from going in and I'm going to have you wander in the wilderness for 40 years to match the number of days that the spies were gone. And everyone basically over the age of 20 is going to die in the wilderness and never get to enter the promised land. And this new generation is going to grow up. They're going to get to enter the promised land and only Caleb and Joshua will be allowed to enter in. How tragic. Can you imagine? Right there on the border of the promised land and you can't go in because you said no, Lord. You said no, Lord. How many times in the Bible do we see people that got to the edge of the promised land and didn't go in? They could have had everything right then and there. The property, the blessings of the Lord, a settled nation, no more wandering, but now they had nothing but regret. No progress, only wandering. No blessing, only the stench of death as a whole generation dies and is buried in the desert. Imagine all the decades of wandering, all the funerals. Imagine the sadness. The only happy person was the undertaker. Imagine the sadness. Forty years of wandering, only miles away from the promised land. Now, going back to one of the themes of Numbers, remember, their unbelief brought unrest. Border their promised land, they don't go in because they don't believe, and their unbelief brings unrest. They basically wandered with no purpose. Forty years, four decades, basically traveling in an 85-mile radius. They went to 16 different places that we know of. The map of their route must have looked like a plate of spaghetti wandering in the wilderness. Oh, by the way, the people were scared to go in and fight and conquer. Guess what happens? In Numbers 14, 45, the Amalekites and Canaanites come out to the desert and start beating up on them anyway. The Amal they come out to the desert and start fighting them anyway. Everything they were scared of happened anyway. Throughout the history of Israel... We see that cycle of sin. Belief brings rest, but then their faith in God wanes. 
They begin to serve other gods. Their unbelief brings trouble. Usually in the form of a conquering enemy, they turn back to God and repent, and their belief brings rest. And we see that cycle happen over and over and over again. It happened this early in the history of Israel, even before they even had their land. Now, let's go to the third division of Numbers. In the third division of Numbers, we meet this new generation. Now, the second generation got to the edge of the promised land, and God took them through the, the, the same thing that He did with the first generation. This second generation is ready to enter in, and God takes them through what? The census, the cleansing, and the communion. Census? Take a census. Cleanse yourself. Consecrate yourself. Get ready. We're going to go into the promised land. Now, this is 40 years later. And then communion. I want to have a relationship with you. A communion time with you. Now, this time the census was not taken by Moses and Aaron because Aaron's passed away by this point. This time the census is taken by Moses and Aaron's son, Eleazar. Now notice this, this is a little detail, but notice this. When they take the census, even though the numbers are all over the board, different commentators, but I think this is true. When they took the census, if you realize the population of Israel has now decreased from what it was at the first census. And then we get into the book of Numbers. I want to just talk to you about all the foundational truths that are told by all of these great stories. There are, there are three or four just Wonderful stories that point to God, that illustrate truths, that point to future salvation, that point to Christ. All these wonderful stories. I'm going to be preaching on some of those next week, next Sunday morning. Make sure that you read about the rebellion of Korah, the sons of Korah and 250 folks that rebelled against Moses and tried to supplant him and tried to put new leadership in place. Make sure that you read about Balaam's talking donkey. Make sure that you read about the fiery serpents. Another, by the way, another, um, another result of their complaining. Plagues, leprosy, fire, the earth swallows up the sons of Korah. But another one is the fiery serpents that came and started biting them. And they were biting them. These were fatal bites. And if you remember the the Lord instructs Moses to form a brass serpent and put it up on a pole. And whoever looked at that serpent uh, would be healed. Read that story. That story is so important that Jesus used it to teach about salvation in the New Testament. Two verses before John 3.16. Remember Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Then John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, so the Lord Jesus Himself uses the book of Numbers, that event where the, where the serpent was raised up on the, on the brass pole um, for the people to look at and be saved as a uh, portend of the salvation that He offers if we'll just believe and look at the Lord Jesus Christ, will be healed, will be saved. And then another story that's sandwiched in the book of Numbers is a sad story about Moses. You remember this story? He too became a victim of unbelief. Combined with his anger management problem. Okay, remember um, um, Numbers 20, uh, verses 8 through, through, uh, through 12. Um, let's go to Exodus 17 first. In Exodus 17, if you remember, God had told, um, 17.6, God had told Moses when they needed water, He said, Behold, I will stand before you there at the rock of Horeb. You shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So, he says, strike the rock. And so he uses his staff. He strikes the rock in Exodus 17, 6. Behold, this fresh water comes out. But now in Numbers, um, Numbers 20, verses 8 through 12, folks, we need to sweat the details when it comes to obedience to the Lord. In, number, in Exodus 20, 12, they needed water again, but now listen to what the Lord says. Take the staff, the Lord says to Moses in verse 8, and assemble the congregation. 
you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So in other words, don't strike the rock, speak to the rock. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them to drink and give to the congregation and their cattle. So what does Moses do? Verse 9, And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he starts speechifying. He starts giving this big dramatic speech that the Lord never said. The Lord just said, simply speak to the rock. Water will come out. They can feed the people and their, and their cattle and their congregation. And no, no, he's risk real drama. He picks up his staff and says, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. But then in verse 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me. I don't know, maybe he trusted in his staff too much. You know, that staff did some magical things. By the way, we shouldn't trust in the things God gives. We ought to trust in God himself. That's what superstition is. Whenever you trust in an icon or an object, that's trusting in things that God gives. No, you trust in God himself. Maybe he started depending too much on the staff and just said, I can't do it without the staff. And so use the staff. He said, God says, no, in verse 12, because you didn't believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly in to the land that I have given them. So basically, in this particular account, the people were complaining about water again. And so Moses takes it to God and God says, speak to the rock. But again, Moses had an anger problem. We know that. He killed the Egyptian soldier. He broke the tablets during the, during the, um, during the Mount Sinai experience. Moses had an anger management problem. So instead of speaking to the rock, he says, basically he makes this big speech and says, we are sick of you people. Speaking about him and the Lord. So now he's speaking for God. We're just sick of you. We're so tired of your complaining. And then instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. He hits it twice with his staff. Now in his grace, God still gives them water. But he says to Moses and Aaron, you're not going to know the rest of the promised land. That reinforces our theme. Unbelief brings distress. But trusting in the Lord brings rest. Moses... You're not going into the promised land. Imagine that. Just imagine. I mean, a novelist couldn't have written this. If I was a novelist, Moses would have gone into the promised land. You can't, you can't make this stuff up, folks. It's just, it's just Moses. Moses, that one that had delivered Israel. The one that had, was, was raised in Pharaoh's court. The one that wandered in the desert to get to know the desert, the one that was just so prepared to lead them, now doesn't get to lead them into the promised land because of disobedience. When you first read this, it seems harsh, but then look at what Moses did. He misrepresented God. He said, we are sick of you people. He misrepresented God. Secondly, he stole God's glory. The Lord simply said to speak to the rock, but oh, with great pride... He wanted to be the center of attention. He struck the rock after a dramatic speech. He, he stole God's glory. Isn't it amazing how our strengths really become our weaknesses? You know, Solomon was the wisest man on earth. But what brought Solomon down? He, got, he became a knucklehead. Moses is called in the book of Numbers the most humble man on the face of the earth. But what brought him down? One moment of pride. Folks, watch out. Your strengths will sometimes become your weaknesses. He misrepresented God. We are sick of you people. He stole God's glory. The Lord simply said to speak to the rock, but yet this dramatic speech with great pride, he strikes the rock. He committed the sin of disobedience by not following the clear instructions of the Lord. And finally, he commits the sin of disbelief by using his staff to hit the rock, probably superstitiously trusting in his staff more than in the God of the staff. Because that staff had turned into a snake. That staff had gotten, rock, had gotten water before. Folks, never trust in objects more than in the Lord. So when you look at God's punishment in this light, it's not harsh at all. Which is probably why Moses didn't push back on God's discipline. Now one thing about Moses, 
didn't push back at all on God's discipline. He accepted the word of the Lord. He realized that he had rebelled and he knew God was right. And in the next book of the Bible, you'll see that um, God has a tender moment uh, with Moses uh, before Moses uh, passes off the scene. So belief in God brings rest. But if you don't trust in the Lord, you'll be distressed and disturbed. So then God made sure it was Joshua that brought the children of Israel into their new nation. Now this new generation was ready. They were once again on the edge of the promised land. They had once again been numbered and organized. They had a great army at the ready. All the leaders were in place. The Lord cleaned them up once again and consecrated them once again. And then in Deuteronomy that we're going to start reading, you'll hear again about all the offerings, laws, vows, and preparations once again. See, this new generation needed to be taught all that. They needed to be retaught the laws of God. Indeed, the, 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 the book Deuteronomy, the title means second law. See, this new group, 40 years later, they needed a second law. Deuteronomy, and they get everything. The Ten Commandments, the ceremonial laws, the civil laws. The second generation, again, they were fired up. They were recommitted. They were going to possess their new land. They worshipped. They made sacrifices. They once again observed the Passover. They had communion with the Lord. We see how much God loves them and how His loving and tender mercy had gone with them now for 40 years. People think God is harsh. Oh no. God is patient, full of compassion, slow to anger, of great mercy. He just travels with this wicked and complaining people for decade after decade after decade as He disciplines them in His justice, as He prepares them to enter the promised land. Why? He's got a covenant with them. That's why. Do you remember? He's got a covenant with these people. And that covenant that God makes with you and me, He will never break. This covenant relationship that He had established with them, as early as the book of Genesis, is now reinforced here in the book of Numbers. Belief brings rest. Great historical stuff, but what does this have to do with us today? Well, each of you has probably been in a situation where your circumstances feel like giants and you feel like a grasshopper about to get crushed. My marriage problems are astronomical. My financial problems are gigantic. My pain is crushing. And the list goes on and on. I can't conquer these giants. I'm about to lose my faith and trust in the Lord. My my pain is crushing. I'm overwhelmed. My strength is minuscule. I can't conquer these titans in my life. But in Numbers, we go back and listen to Joshua and Caleb, the minority report. Don't always believe the majority. The minority report of these two lone spies that say to the people and to the other spies, in Numbers 14, 9, don't rebel against the Lord in your unbelief and do not be afraid. It's the same message that God is giving us through them. Today, God is bigger than any giant in your life. You may feel like you're the end of your rope. You may feel like nothing can be done. There's no hope. You're in a desert. You want to give up. You may even want to end it all. But don't give up. The Bible says God is bigger than any giant that you face. Each of you has a personal experience where you face down the giants because God is a bigger giant. God is bigger than any giant that's trying to crush you. God is bigger than any bully that's trying to defeat you. I remember um, in middle school, I had a kid in middle school named, named Mike Thrift. Mike Thrift. Mike Thrift was like 5'11 in middle school. He was the biggest kid in middle school. So needless to say, when we chose sides for basketball, whoever got to the first choice would always choose Mike Thrift. And whatever team had Mike Thrift is going to win. And so one day, 
We were about to choose sides up for basketball. There were about 10 of us. We were going to play shirts and skins. And I just got real smart. I just stepped right in the middle of the crowd. And I just said, look, me and Mike Thrift will take on all of you. So. So, and I'm not even a good basketball player. All of you, what do you know? Mike Thrift's going to win. Mike Thrift. Me plus Mike Thrift is the majority. And, um, and God plus you is a majority. God is bigger than any giant that is trying to face you down. You can attack those bullies. There's something that we need to remind ourselves of. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against spiritual enemies, spiritual bullies, but God says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, you might think, these, these, um, these, these bullies and giants are, are bigger. I've, I've passed the deadline. I've, I'm, 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 beyond, I'm beyond help. There's, there's nothing that can be done. My problems are too great. But the Bible says, oh no, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of their strongholds. Here's another verse. They overcame Him with the, with the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They overcame the devil. This is, what, this is what Numbers teaches us. Don't let those giants face you down. Go into the promised land with God. Don't say no to God. Say this, my pain is great, but I'm not giving up. I'm taking my pain to the Lord and I'm walking with Him all the way. I believe God wants to reconcile my marriage, reclaim my children, forgive that person that was so hateful to me, restore that relationship. Just take on these giants with prayer. Pray. Have you fasted about that issue? Have you fasted about that problem? You might be on the edge of the promised land. Tomorrow might be the end of that 11-day journey. And God says, go into victory. Don't listen to those 10 Spies and the majority, listen to the minority report. As Joshua and Caleb says, do not rebel against the Lord in your unbelief and do not be afraid. And after you get to that promised land and after your promised victory, you'll look back and you'll see the hand of God. You know, sometimes we can't see the hand of God when, the, when, the, when we're in the middle of it. Sometimes we can't see the hand of God we're, 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 when we're at the, the outset of it. Only in the past tense do we look back and we see God's hand was with me. Every step of the way. And then after your promised victory, you may be that Joshua or Caleb in somebody else's life. As you say to some other people, don't rebel against the Lord your God in your unbelief and do not be afraid. God will fight your battles, but you've got to stay close to His side as you fight. And remember the theme of um, the book of Numbers. Unbelief brings distress, but trust brings rest. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this uh, time that we've had again to bathe in your word, to luxuriate into your word, your, to study your word, uh, to, um, to hear your word taught and preached, um, uh, uh, to, to memorize your word, uh, to learn your word. But the most important thing is, of course, to be doers of the word. And so help us, Lord, to uh, not just let this be an exercise in, in, um, in just academia, but help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Lord, change us. And uh, Lord, we pray for that deacon uh, service, ordination service on Wednesday night. What a joy it's going to be to see our church family gather around our, our three um, newly ordained deacons to Lay hands on them to encourage them. Lord, continue to build your church here at South Main. Continue to build our lives. Lord, help us not to be like the children of Israel, but I'm afraid that I am more often than not. But Lord, thank you for your patience. Just go with me every step of the way, Lord. Help me to rest in my faith in you. And then bring us back next Sunday full of great stories about victories won, how we've ministered um, as we have placed our trust in you. Help us to conquer all those giants 
that are in the land. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you for coming out in the rain.